Just by way of, of introduction of, of what we do and what's actually out on the table, so in case any of you are interested, this is a, like a core series of sessions that we do. For example, if I come into a church or a convention, things like that. This, these will, the t will be the core topics that I'll do, typically a Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, or any way that you want to configure it. And so, as you can see, a lot of the stuff relates to uh, the biblical flood, obviously, and creation. But what we try to do in this series is answer the basic questions that people have about creation, evolution topics. And we find that this series answers the, the common questions that people have. And of course, if there are deeper questions, we have other resource material and we have a lot of different seminars as well, like Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon is part of our flood series. And uh, we have another one called The Stricken Earth, which is not in DVD form yet. We hope to actually start filming that this year. But it takes the earth from the flood to now. Why is this planet so stricken with many damaging features, na nasty weather, uh, volcanoes, earthquakes, all these things, you know, the uh, uh, earth, earth radioactivity. What is the origin of these things? Why is the earth so stricken? Well, it all relates directly back to the global flood. And, that, and that's an absolutely catastrophic event. So it's important that we understand that. And part of that um, is, the, is the look at the Grand Canyon. And that's what we're looking at uh, tonight. It's kind of a, it's kind of a fun thing, and, and, and I'll show you that in a minute. Some of the things that we include out on the table, too, we actually have a kind of a fun little quiz DVD that you actually have to work with your remote, so it's interactive. It's 30 questions. They're multiple choice, so you know it's going to be easy. All right. I also have a curriculum I wrote uh, for basically for the homeschooling, homeschooling uh, folks or even Sunday schools, whatever. Um, and then this is the one we're doing tonight. Also, a number of years ago, some parents began to ask, you know, about... Uh, biblically accurate but adventurous, adventuresome, nature-oriented, creation-oriented videos for kids so that they don't have to constantly filter out the evolution from the stuff they watch on, on public TV or whatever. So we started a whole series called The Adventures of Ranger Mike. And so that's, that's what those are. Those are out on the table as well. And if you want, uh, my wife is sitting at the back. Say hi. You have to say hi. That's my wife, Carrie. Obviously, in, uh, obviously the better half of our relationship and our ministry. So, I'm the person you see, but she's, uh, she's the more important person. So, anyway, so this is a series that we have now, and there's more coming. There's, there's actually more than this, uh, and there's more coming. So, it's kind of our, an ongoing thing that we are hoping to produce many, uh, many, many, feature, many different uh, topics for. So, with that in mind... Uh, that just introduces what's on the table. So if you have any questions, Carrie will be there to, to handle your questions. So uh, starting, the, starting the Grand Canyon session, I want to start it by mentioning that a while ago there was a businessman in Pittsburgh who was found dead in his house. And the scene was very bloody. There was blood all in the bathroom, in the, in the, in the shower uh, the man's bed was full of blood, and he was lying there, and it looked like his, the last act that he did was, try, was trying to reach for his phone before he finally just bled out and died. So all the detectives were in the house looking to try to figure out who wanted to murder this guy. How did the murderer get in? Um, what was he after? Is this a robbery gone bad? Had this guy crossed somebody, you know, and uh, they were trying to find all the answers to this puzzle. One detective looked carefully at all the evidence and said, guys, 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 I don't think this was a murder at all. This was a terrible accident. Let me show you what happened. And he pieced together the evidence that was there, the plate lying on the floor. Every, he was able to figure out that this man had slipped, carrying some food upstairs, slipped, hit his head hard right on the railing right there, and he began to bleed profusely, thought he could handle it himself by going into the shower. One thing led to another. He tried to lie down and sleep it off, but he realized he was in trouble. He was so weak, by the time he reached for the phone, he couldn't make, even make the call and died. All the experts were looking one way, thinking this was a murder. It took one guy looking at the same evidence that they could see to realize this wasn't a murder at all. This was a terrible accident. So in a very real sense, but very different as well, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the body we want to look at tonight. Because all of the experts are looking one direction, 
as to how in the world this canyon formed, and their conclusions as millions of years of the Colorado River carving it out. Number of years ago, it took one man, Dr. Walter Brown, to look at the evidence not only at the canyon, but especially all over the southwestern portion of the Colorado Plateau to figure out this was no Colorado River carving this thing over millions of years. This was a catastrophic event. His theory is now one of the leading theories even among evolutionists who still don't buy into a global flood. But they all know, many of them know, this was catastrophism locally. So what we want to do in this program tonight is we want to look at three things. What is the canyon? This will be a brief thing. The main part of the program is how did it form? That's what everybody wants to know. The last thing we want to look at is when did this happen? What formed the canyon and when? Now most people, when you stand at the edge of the canyon, you go, wow, look at this big hole. How did that happen? But they don't turn around and look what's behind them off in the distance because behind them are buttes made out of sedimentary layers that are even higher than the level you're standing on. And when you look at that, your heart sinks. You think, oh no, there's something else that had to happen even before this canyon formed. So people who are asking the question, what happened here? They're only asking the second question. So in this program, the tightrope I have to walk is to try to make this as easy to understand for folks who just want to know the answer. What happened? Just tell me what happened. And I could do that in three minutes. But a lot of people like the little bit, at least a little bit of nitty gritty to have a look at, okay, why do you think that? Why, why did Dr. Brown come up with, these, with this conclusion? So the challenge for me tonight is to make it simple, but also give you enough information to kind of whet your appetite with it. So <clears throat> let's, let's start by looking at what the canyon is. And if you look at the nation as a whole, Grand Canyon itself is such a large feature that you can see it, it's that size compared to the whole nation. It's a very big feature. Now, if you look at it from the perspective of an airplane, just flying over it, you can see that it is just a sudden gouge into the earth. And if you look at all the layers, you can see all the layers there, about a mile in depth, and right in the middle, you'll see this dark brown area there. That is called the inner gorge. Oops, my little thing is slipping off here. That's called the inner gorge, and at the bottom of the inner gorge is where the Colorado River is flowing. Now, as the camera just sort of tilt, tilts up a little bit more, you can actually see the canyon goes way off into the haze. Again, as you look at it, you can see it's just a sudden gouge into the, into the earth. Now, on the ground, it's a completely different story because there you'll stand at the side and you'll just be totally amazed. How many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, so then that means half of you have not, correct? All right, so let me show you. <laughs> I'm brilliant in my deductive reasoning. <laughs> Every fall, based on this program and this DVD, the, when this DVD was first released, two people came to us and said, would you take us out there and show us this? I, mean, I said, what? Anyway, that led to the Southwest Safari, which we do at the end of every October into November. It's a 10-day trip, and we do all the national parks there that you're about to see on this program because they're all related to the same event. So if you're interested, this will be our 11th or 12th year that we're doing this and, uh, and, and this fall. And by the way, this thing fills up in two days nowadays. So when we release the information, everybody has to have their questions answered because it fills up so quickly. Um, so, when you're on the ground, and those of you who've been there know what I mean. It's, it's got like an aura all its own. The wind and the sounds and the pulse coming out of that canyon is absolutely astounding when you stand there and look at these just yawning cliffs all around you. And you can stand in some areas that you're protected, but in some areas you're not. You can just walk right along the rim. And, uh, <laughs> and there are rim trails that are you know, not quite right at the edge like this. But it's, a, it's an amazing sight when you're just standing right at the edge. Now, you know, isn't this always the way it is? You're standing there trying to take a picture and there's some clown standing in your way. Let's just, let's just get rid of that guy. Okay, now, okay, now you, get a better, now you get a better look here. So, we're standing at a prominent area on the south rim and we're, so, and we're looking east. Now, notice that, they, that the actual rim of the canyon in this area slopes up to the rim. The, the land slopes up to the rim as you can see, and then way off in the distance over there, this is where the canyon of the Little Colorado River flows in from the east. You'll see that better when we show you an aerial view of this. But this is what it looks like right from when you're standing there. Now, 
When you consider what the canyon is and how phenomenal it is, it's no wonder that about half a million people visit this thing every year. So let's have a look at a, a, a 180 degree view from one of the prominent views on the South Rim. The South Rim is where most people will view the canyon from. So, so standing at a prominent view looking straight west, there you can see the Colorado River flowing away from you right in the middle. Now we're going to start panning toward the north. Let's have a look at a few interesting demographics about it. The canyon itself is 216 miles long and averages between 4 and 18 miles wide and it averages about a mile in depth. What we're doing now is we're looking straight north and you're seeing off in the distance the other part of that raised area. It's called the Kaibab Uplift or the Kaibab Plateau. Right in the middle, the Colorado River is flowing from your right to your left. And now as we're sort of looking northeast, the Colorado River is flowing south through Marble Canyon. And then it does a very curious thing. It makes a 90 degree bend and flows right through this Kaibab Upwarp. And that poses a lot of problems for people. Now we're looking straight to the east and you can see a little tiny tower off in the corner right there. That is the Desert View Watchtower. It's designed to make it look very old, but it's actually not that old. But it's at least at the, it's at the eastern end of the tourist roads within the National Park. So that's, if you're coming in from the east side, it's the first place you'll be able to get out and look at the canyon. If you're leaving, it's the last place you can look at. So it's the very eastern end of the, of the, the road in the National Park. Looking at it from the air, looking at it from way above, let's show you some of the features in the area. Down here's Flagstaff, the major city in the area. Up there is Page where the waters of, uh, I mean, where the, the Glen Canyon Dam holds the, the waters of Lake Powell. And then off to the, the west is Las Vegas, off the, off the side. I'm just going to adjust this projector just a little bit again here, just to keep it from, uh, from going right off the top there. there. Is that better? Now it's not going off the top. All right. So. That gives you a, like a, a, a kind of a quick view. This is all northwestern Arizona. So everything you see is in northwestern Arizona. Now, Grand Canyon Village is the preeminent spot where most people will go and stay. All, most of the hotels are there, the IMAX movie theater, the shops, the, you know, gift shops, all the kinds of things are pretty much right there. And then from that, from Grand Canyon Village, that's as far west as you can drive your car. But from there, you can go east to that little tower that I just showed you. So that little yellow road is the only place in the National Park you can actually drive your car and see the Grand Canyon. So those of you who have gone to, the, to this portion of the canyon and you, and you say you've seen the Grand Canyon, actually, from that road, from anywhere on that road, all you can see is about 10 to 15% of the Grand Canyon. So if you've been there, that's about all you can see. You've seen a small portion of Grand Canyon. It is really huge. Now notice, I'm gonna point this out later on, but notice Grand Canyon is mostly made up of side canyons. You see the track of the Colorado River going right through there, but Grand Canyon is mostly made up of large side canyons. Some of them are smaller, but many of them are you know, many miles in, but it's mainly made up of side canyons. That's important to remember. Okay, now, that's just what the canyon is. Now we're gonna get into the meat of this. How did the canyon form? What in the world caused the canyon to form? The problem though is much bigger than just Grand Canyon. Let's, let's see what, what I mean by that. Grand Canyon is the area that is highlighted in blue. Notice it has a general east-west configuration. Now that's important if you, if, for the understanding this theory. That's the area in blue. Marble Canyon has a north-south configuration. It is a separate canyon that joins right where the Little Colorado comes in from the east. That is another canyon. But Marble Canyon has a north-south configuration. That's important to also understand. Now, a little portion of Grand Canyon is highlighted here in yellow. This is Nankoweep Canyon, a portion of Grand Canyon. We highlight that because a very curious thing happened there one time. Long ago, however long ago, whatever that long ago means, a whole civilization lived in that canyon. There's evidence of civilization all through that canyon, but they can't live there anymore. And there's a specific reason why. And we'll look at that. So here you have an area I've highlighted in yellow. 
Let's start by looking at problems that people who try to explain the canyon face. So let's take that area and blow it up. Now you're looking at that area that was in the box. First of all, let me show you this Kaibab Plateau, that raised area. The problem for standard geological explanations of the canyon is they're assuming that this Kaibab Plateau, this upwarp, was there all along at the beginning. But let me show you what I mean. That yellow dot is where we were standing when I showed you most of the South Rim pictures. And we were looking across the canyon to that yellow dot. And so you can see how far that was, even though it's relatively small on the map. So that's way across the canyon. Now, the Colorado River does something very strange here. It's heading south out of Marble Canyon and makes a 90 degree bend right through a mountain. Now that poses problems to the standard geological explanations. But again, there's a whole bunch of theories. How did a river turn and go right through a mountain? Well, they realize that that's impossible, so what would have done that? And there's all kinds of theories, most of them just really, really far-fetched as to how that could have happened. Here's another problem. Look over in Marble Canyon. The river is flowing south, but notice the direction of all of the tributaries. Which way are they all facing? To the north. That's why they're called barbed canyons. They're facing the wrong way. Now, when I say the wrong way, think of it this way. When you see a river flowing in, in one direction, most of the tributaries are generally facing the same direction because they're draining the same basic area. These are facing the wrong way or a different way, which, which means that the flow from these tributaries was to the north. That means that this land down here was all tipped up facing to the north so that water in that area was flowing to the north into a gorge which is flowing south. This is anomaly. <laughs> this is another big anomaly that, that poses problems for standard explanations of the canyon. So, when we look back at our, our, our drawing of the canyon, the photograph of the canyon, or like say the, the map image, Grand Canyon itself represents an 800 cubic mile excavation. Now, uh, there was a man years ago, an older man who 100 years or so ago, he used to take groups up to the rim of the canyon and he would show people that, school groups and whatnot. And <laughs> he would always tell people when they said, you know, how in the world did this thing take place? He, al he always would say, I dug it. <laughs> and everybody would get a kick out of that. Ha ha ha. Finally, one little girl said, what did you do with the dirt? <laughs> Well, that kind of took him by surprise. He didn't have a little smart little answer to give back to her. But on his deathbed, he said to his family, what do you suppose I did do with all that dirt? Because that's still a problem to the evolutionary models. They don't know what happened to all of that 800 cubic miles of excavated material. Well, that's only part of the problem. If you look at where the canyon is, this yellow line represents the southwestern edge of the Colorado Plateau. On top of the plateau, represented in this darker brown area, that is an area of missing rock above where you stand at the rim of the canyon today. There is a 1,000 foot thick layer of what's known in standard geology as Mesozoic rock that is no longer there. All around the rest of the plateau, it's still there. But in this general region, it's not. Now, this represents, this is another huge area that represents another 2,000 cubic miles of material that has been removed by something. And so this has been known, again, to the evolutionary models. They've called this the great denudation. Something denuded this whole bunch of rock all through this region denuded 2,000 cubic miles of material. So here's kind of what it would have looked like. You have all that Mesozoic rock there. Something has to come along and bulldoze 2,000 cubic miles off, and then and only then can you gouge out the canyon another 800 cubic miles. So we're talking about two <laughs> massive excavation projects. What caused the first? What caused the second? Most people only know to ask the second question because that's what they're standing looking at. And there were two. The first one was even bigger. So here are some problems. Here again, this Kaibab Plateau, you can actually see it better in this backed off image better. You can see what kind of, how high that is right through that region. Look to the south especially. You can actually see little bumps. 
A lot of these little bumps, especially this one here, a lot of these little bumps represent buttes that look like this. There are buttes all through this area. What are they made of? They're made of sedimentary layers for the most part, but at the top there is hard rock, usually lava. Now the lava is there because when the plateau raised up, now even evolutionists know this, they know that as mountains sink, they, they, they push lava in, under, underneath adjacent material and lift up a plateau. They would just say that it happened over millions and millions of years. This is much more catastrophic than that. But still, lava is the, you might say, is the hydraulic force pushing up the plateau. So in some places, it leaked out onto the top. So here you have all these little buttes pockmarked here and there all over this, all over this limestone everywhere around the south rim. Notice just south of the rim, in fact, if you've been to the south rim, you went right past this feature. It's called Red Butte. It's 1,000 feet high and it is that Mesozoic layer. It's all that's left of it in the immediate area. Some, for some reason, whatever bulldozed off that 1,000 foot layer, it, it left part of it here. It, it didn't bulldoze this part away. It's kind of worn smooth as you can see, but something just left this portion of it there. If you look at a photograph taken from the air of the rim of the canyon, you can see, follow that yellow arrow, that's the edge of the canyon right there. Right here is Red Butte. All of this rock you're standing on is hard kaibab limestone. It's very hard. It's 350 foot thick layer of hard kaibab limestone. But here's that red butte made out of softer Mesozoic rock still left in the area. So let's have a look at kind of a diagram. Uh, PowerPoint is not animating software, so I have to kind of force it to animate. So, th th so they're elementary, but I th hope you'll get the picture. So here you have all the layers of sediment that make up the region. So here you would have hard rock or lava that probably came from deep down as the plateau lifted up and cooled on the top, making a big rock formation on the, on the, the, the top of the plateau. There's that Mesozoic layer, 1,000 feet thick. Something comes along at some point and bulldozes off that softer layer, but wherever there's hard rock or lava, that protected the material below it, so then that leaves a butte which is what we still see today. But then you get right down to this hard kaibab limestone. Once it is breached by something, something has to breach it, then all of this much softer stuff is so much easier to scour right through and right at the bottom of the inner gorge is where the Colorado River flows. So now where you stand at the north rim or the south rim, you're standing on a 350 foot thick layer of hard kaibab limestone. Now remember that because it's important for a little bit later on and just kind of setting the scene here. So now let's have a look at the three different views of the canyon that you might have heard about. The first one is the standard geological evolutionary idea of, that involves millions of years. The next one is a receding flood. As waters receded off the planet, it gouged out the canyon. Last one is a post-flood catastrophe. This is the one that we're proposing tonight. Let's have a look at some of the the standard geological ideas. Number one, there are at least eight published theories as to what might have formed the canyon. But <laughs> most of them will cite the Colorado River and all of them state that it was, that it was millions and millions of years that, that, that took place here. Well, there are basic problems. Number one, now geologists know, most geologists who work there know this, but it's, it's gonna take it many years before it filters down to the public signs, of course. But they know a river cannot carve a canyon like this. Grand Canyon is mainly made up of side canyons. A river is not going to go back and forth and carve up these huge side canyons and each of them with many little side canyons. That's not the kind of way, that's not the way a river carves anything. This is, a river can't carve this kind of a canyon. Secondly, none of the theories explain the many anomalies. Number one, the great denudation. How did, what made it, what denuded that whole area of that rock? The Kaiblat Plateau, what, why, how did the river turn and bend right through that, right through that mountain? Where did the 2,800 cubic miles of dirt go? The Barb Canyons, the huge side canyons, etc. None of those theories explain all of these problems. Secondly though, the receding flood idea has some very glaring problems too. Number one, if this is what happened, there should be many Grand Canyons all over the world. Why? 
The reason is, you and I would all know, you and I would agree on the global flood having produced all of the sedimentary layers found around the world. After the flood, those sedimentary layers would still have been somewhat soft and clay-like, saturated with water. So as water is flowing off the earth, and as the new rivers are starting to form in like little gullies or whatever, and as the water is kind of finding that lowest point and carving out rivers, there should be many Grand Canyons throughout the whole earth if that is what caused it. But Grand Canyon is unique. Grand Canyon is sitting high on a plateau. That's the difference. But if this was receding floodwaters, there should be many Grand Canyons worldwide. There aren't. There are many rivers, but only one Grand Canyon. Secondly, this idea imagines way, way too much water. Since the Colorado Plateau, which is absolutely essential to the formation of Grand Canyon, rose after the flood. Here's what I mean. If the plateau, which sits 6,000 feet above sea level, if it was underwater during the flood, not to mention the 14,000 foot peaks to the east, they would have also had to have been underwater during the flood. You have an absolutely, sorry, this thing keeps falling off. Uh, uh, they have an absolutely impossible task of explaining where the water went. But if you imagine that the flood with the moving continents, as we'll, as we'll show you in a moment, literally buckled up the mountains up and out of the water and later as the continents settled, pushing up a plateau, that all had to have happened later. If it's happening during the flood or if it has already happened, you're having way too much water and there's no way you can explain where all the water for the flood went. That, is an, that it becomes an impossibility. So that couldn't be, that's a major problem for just a receding flood. Lastly, a receding flood wouldn't be so selective. If the water is just sliding off the planet, it should have denuded almost all of the plateau. Why did it only denude just that southwest portion? Why is the Mesozoic layer still there? In any event, these are just some of the issues. What we want to look at tonight is a post-flood catastrophe. This concept squares with all of the observable facts. That's why I call this, this program the puzzle on the plateau. All these puzzle pieces have been lying around on the plateau for many years for geologists to see. It wasn't until Dr. Brown came along and said, if I put them together like this, it all seems to fit. And by the way, your confidence in a theory goes up if the thing that you are trying to explain by your theory explains more than just what you're trying to explain. What do I mean by that? Let's just say that you're trying to explain problem A. And your theory adequately explains problem A. In fact, it, it does a pretty good job of it. But in your ex explanation of problem A, your answer also happens to perfectly explain problems B, C, D, E, and F. Then your confidence in the theory goes up. That's exactly what this does, as you'll see. So this concept seems to square much better with the available facts. So the starting assumptions are very minimal. And it explains much more than just a canyon because there's so many other puzzle pieces on the plateau, and it was a very, very rapid event. Now, let me hit you first of all with the simple proposal, then we'll kind of get into the meat of it. Dr. Brown was proposing that after the flood, and this, this is easily, you can actually easily picture this in your mind. All over the world, as the floodwaters receded off the planet, the world would have naturally been left with little bowl-shaped basins brim full of water. Everywhere where there was a little depression, that would have been a lake. There would have been probably bazillions of lakes all around the world. Most of them simply dried up because there wasn't enough rainfall to sustain them or any rivers flowing in to maintain them. So most of them dried up. Lake Chad is still with us, the Great Lakes are still with us, but most of the post-flood lakes dried up. In this region, he is proposing that there were two lakes. He named the one Grand Lake and the other Hopi Lake. Grand Lake was in several different states. Hopi Lake was all in just in eastern Arizona, or mainly the eastern part of Arizona. He's proposing that there were two giant lakes that were on the plateau. The dark area that you see there is the plateau, and these lakes were on top of that area that became, that rose after the flood and carried the lakes up with it. He's proposing that there might have been some other higher lakes that might have breached and added water to these lakes, plus the fact you have rainfall and melting snow and ice from the mountains, adding more and more water to the lakes. And eventually, Grand Lake breaches in the southwest corner. And when it does, it sends a massive sheet of water 
to the south. Do you remember the general configuration of Marble Canyon, a north-south canyon? It sends a huge sheet of water to the south. As that water just rushes across a plateau, it spreads out into a giant sheet, rapidly denuding the plateau, removing 1,000 feet of soft Mesozoic layer. But in doing so, it wears away the west wall of Hopi Lake, and those waters gush straight west, and the remainder of Grand Lake joins with it, and they both gush straight west. What is the general configuration of Grand Canyon? East-West. So, this is his proposal, that these two breached lakes rapidly formed Grand Canyon and, as the lakes re uh, left the area, left behind some astounding features which today are in many national and state parks. Let me show you uh, the, basically the five necessary foundation phases. Obviously, the without the global flood, you don't, have, you don't have this amount of water, you don't have sedimentary layers, you don't have mountains and everything. Uh, without the global flood, this is the foundation. Sliding continental plates, if you were here two years ago, three years ago when we were here, I did the, I did the, um, the program called The Horror of the Flood and we showed a little demonstration of the hydroplate theory. It's on the, the video we have out there. The sliding plates, which when they ground to a halt, literally produced huge amounts of lava at the base. And as they ground to a halt, they literally just buckled. And as they buckled, they wrinkled up the mountains. That's the mountain formation. And then as they slowly sank over the centuries, it pushed up the plateaus. And then the lakes connect, continued to grow on top of the plateau. So let's have a look at each of these. Global flood is a given. The sliding plates and mountain formation. Here you have, during the flood, the Atlantic Ridge rises first. And, and again, we, we cover this in our program called The Stricken Earth. I don't want to get into the details of this, but um, according to this theory, the Atlantic Ridge rises first. As it does so, continents slide away from it. The Americas slide westward, Africa, Asia, Europe slides eastward. And as those continents grind to a halt, here's another quick little animation. You can see the sky, the floodwaters, and the, and the earth below. Here comes a sliding continent. Again, this is elementary, but hopefully you get, you get the point. Here comes a sliding continent. It already has the sedimentary layers on top. As it's sliding, it's beginning to squeeze out all that lubricating water underneath it that the Bible talks about. These are the fountains of the deep. As it slides and squeezes all that out, what do you think is going to happen at the base? It's going to get very, very hot. It is going to literally crack and buckle. There's going to be lava squirting up through the rocks. It's going to be, a, it's going to be cataclysm at the, at the base. But then as it grinds to a halt, it's also going to push up the mountains. So here's the mountains you know, rising and buckling up out of the floodwaters. Now you have the floodwaters literally slowly over time uh, beginning to recede into the new ocean basins that have been created. So now you have the Pacific Ocean, you have the Western states, and you have the Rocky Mountains. Just a quick kind of a cutaway version. Smack in the middle of Colorado, you have the nation's highest cliff. They call this the Painted Cliff. Why do they do that? Well, it looks like it's been painted, but what actually is this? This is evidence of massive heat and liquid rock pouring through this. And with the immense heat that it would have been generated, basically at the base where, it where the heat was the, the strongest. Higher up away from the, the, the cracking and the buckling like that, you'd have sedimentary layers that wouldn't have gotten that hot. But in many cases, they would have bent. Now, folks, this is in Maryland at Sidling Hill. They actually have an evolutionary you know, interpretation center there because of this unique feature. What makes it so unique? Bent rock. You cannot bend rock, but you can bend mud and clay. How about this? These are the Rocky Mountains of Western Canada. Now look at this. The entire depth of the mountain is not only bent, but severely kinked. You can't bend rock like that. If, if, even if you give it millions of years, you compress a mountain, you're just gonna wind up with a pile of rubble. The only way you can get it to, to bend like this, parallel to each other, is if all of these layers are still soft and permeable like clay and mud. Otherwise, once it turns to rock, you're not gonna get it to wrinkle like this. So something catastrophic is squeezing that content, is compressing it, literally buckling it and wrinkling it as it pushes it up. I, see, I, I have not seen any other explanation 
whether secular or creation-based, that it comes near close to understanding how this would have happened. It, it, and in our flood video, or the flood session, we actually even include some other phenomenal things we found out at um, Glacier National Park. We went on this hike up and, and went to this, this, uh, this lake, and I got a, a picture with my camera between two waterfalls, and you should, just, you should see this. It's, it's astounding. The, the whole mountainside, it looks like it's made of putty because every layer is about the size of a human and just layer after layer after layer. But as they come down, they sort of undulate like this, but finally it gets, gets down toward the bottom. They literally fold back under on themselves, over themselves, just like, just like putty. I mean, you're not going to get that once it turns to stone, folks. It can't happen. So I have all of this buckling up of the mountains. Now you have plateau uplift. So here's what's going to happen. As the mountain is skidding to a halt, literally pushing up higher and higher, and the bottom of the mountain, it's called the root. The root of the mountain goes down. You're going to have a couple things that we need to look at. Number one, the mountains right after the flood would have been higher than they are today. And also you would have had many post-flood lakes, most of which just dried up, of course. But now as time goes on, the mountain is slowly going to sink. As it does so, it's going to get very, very hot at the base. And the base is going to turn very molten. And what's going to happen? Now you, have the, now you have a lowered mountain. Mountains are, are definitely lower than what they are, than, than what they were. But now the lava begins to migrate underneath. And that pushes up a plateau. Notice something. The Colorado Plateau, in this case, is a mile now, a mile above sea level. Now, any lakes in this area would have risen with the plateau, and here is the crux right here. The height gave the lakes huge potential energy. There would be no Grand Canyon at all if it wasn't sitting on a mile-high plateau. Now, some people have said, well, we don't, we don't see enough evidence that there was a big lake up there. Now that many people, in fact, standard geology has, has now fully recognized Hopi Lake. But Grand Lake, they said, well, you know, um, you know we're not so sure we don't we see the, you know, the, the borders of that. That's because it didn't rise up evenly. If the whole plateau had just gone up like that, you might be able to consistently see the edge of the, of, of the lake. But here's what happened. It's kind of like hydraulic forces at work. As the lava migrates, it's going to push up the plateau first in the areas of weakest resistance. So some areas are going to rise quicker, faster, earlier than other areas. So as the plateau is kind of rising like this, the lake is probably going like this. It's shifting all around like Yellowstone Lake does today because of the huge forces going on there. That lake constantly shifts its borders today. So that's what's happening here. Um, and some places rose higher than other. Bryce Canyon, if any, if any of you have ever been to Bryce Canyon, beautiful. I mean, it's 8,100 feet above sea level. So that's even 2,000 feet higher than the average uh, elevation of the plateau. So you have Bryce Canyon fairly high, but still the, the plateau rises to an average of 6,000, 6,200 feet or so above sea level. And it, has, it, it didn't rise up evenly. It rose up in points of weakest resistance first. And lastly, you have the growing lakes high on a plateau. So here you have the plateau, right there it is in yellow. So now you're having these lakes growing because of water that is draining in from the mountains and rain and so forth. Now I'm going to draw a kind of like a little yellow box. It kind of looks like a National Geographic cover, right? <laughs> okay, notice what's in that box. The southwestern portion of Grand Lake, the northwestern portion of Hopi Lake. Okay, I'm going to blow that up because it's so easy. Now, it, hopefully this will make it easy to understand what happened because this is the crucial area. There are three basic aspects to this catastrophe. If you understand these aspects, you'll grasp the point of this theory. Number one is easy to understand. Who here does not understand that you do not want to be below a dam when it breaks? <laughs> okay, I mean, we all, we all know that, okay? Okay, so, so we all understand, okay, the, the, a breach dam, okay? Now, the second part is uplifting sedimentary layers, and the last is subsurface water flowing. Let me talk about the uplifting sedimentary layers first. There have been numerous documentations as well uh, on, in, in modern times that if you remove a huge amount of material from the surface of the earth, like in strip mining, 
the material below can actually buckle up because of the weight of the material pushing down on both sides. So it can literally buckle up. And people learned that to their chagrin with losing heavy machinery in these, the bottom of these big strip mines when machinery falls down and cracks and whatever. So what's happening is as, a, as material is moved, set the, the layers underneath where that material was begin to literally push up. Any water inside those layers is going to flow which direction? That way. Let's just say this is north. It's going to flow that way. Well, if you already have a gouge here and a river flowing here that's south, if this material suddenly pushes up, any water flowing from here is going to flow to the north into a southward flowing river. Or do you see where I'm going now with the barb canyons? That's what we mean by uplifting sedimentary layers. Subsurface water flowing is important to understand too. And let me be gross for a moment. Picture if I took a knife and just sliced into my arm and I made a, a valley with that blade. What's going to happen? Blood, blood going this way and this way is going to flow into that valley that I just made and it's going to leak into that valley and I'm going to bleed. So picture a plateau or picture an area that's full of sedimentary layers that are full of water. Now picture something giant coming along and gouging, a huge gouge right through all those layers. The water inside the plateau is going to start pouring into that gouge. Do you follow that? So as the water is pouring into the gouge, it's no longer supporting the land on either side. So that land will start to collapse. So you have collapses at regular intervals all along the main flow of the river. Now, let's watch that. Let's kind of watch that happening. So here you have uh, Grand Lake and it breaches. It's kind of anyone's speculation as to how this might have happened, but finally what happens is the lake gets big enough that it breaches somehow. So the, the water rushes out through a little gorge that it makes. Well, rushing water, as you know, is highly erosive. And so what it's going to do is it's going to make the gouge much wider. The wider the gouge, the more the water. The more the water, the higher, the bigger the gouge. And you're going to have a runaway catastrophe. And you're going to have a runaway flow of water. What's going to happen then is it's going to wear away the western wall of Hopi Lake and the water of both lakes is going to rush out to the west, leaving behind this hard Kaibab limestone. You also leave behind this funnel. This is known now as the funnel. This is eight miles wide at the mouth, 13 miles long. And it's, it's there, there to this day that you can see in Route 89. You can actually go the whole way through it and you can actually watch that. Now, the rock on both sides is still there and it's pushing down. So that softer rock is pushing down on both sides. That causes such force right between these two cliffs that that softer limestone or that harder limestone that, that's left there bulges up right down the middle and cracks. That crack now is carrying the Colorado River and it has ever since. It's still draining what's left of, of this big grand lake that has just dumped. So this bulges up and cracks right down through. Now, let's look at a cutaway view. This is where the funnel, this is where the material was. That material is all washed away. That's where the dam was. Now what you have is rock on both sides pushing down. That's causing the center to bulge up and crack. And as you drive through this whole area, you can see all the sedimentary layers literally pushed up toward the crack. And when you stand on Navajo Bridge, looking right down through that crack, you can actually see the Colorado River flowing right beneath you, right in that 350 foot thick layer of hard Kaibab limestone. That's what bulged up and cracked right at the bottom of Marble Canyon, right at the base of the funnel, at the beginning of the funnel. Now, what's going to happen is all of this material to the south is literally going to lift up facing to the north. The canyon region south of the funnel lifts up as a tremendous weight of material is removed and now huge amounts of subsurface water are going to even pour from the sides and they're going to form the barbed canyons rapidly because all that water is flowing now to the north as it leaks out into a southward flowing river. Notice the general track of the Colorado River. It's, it's more or less put here, and I've been very generous with this, allowing a lot of side canyons there, but this is the general track of the Colorado River. Notice something. There's no source of surface water that could have carved the huge side canyons, which I'm not showing you that yet, 
much of the entire canyon area was carved out by escaping subsurface water. And as you look at the actual canyon, there you can see it. There's the track of the Colorado River, but most of the Grand Canyon is made up of the side canyons that a river can't carve. These are collapses at regular intervals where there's no longer any water. It all leaked out and all of that material just, just washed away. Now, notice Nankoweep Canyon that I talked about before. As this whole area lifted up as well, there was a huge amount of water inside that Kaibab upwarp. And it began to leak out in many little streams and rivers flowing out through Nankoweep Canyon for perhaps hundreds of years. Eventually, and so a whole civilization could live there. Eventually, the water all ran out of the plateau, and now no, nobody can live there anymore. And they left behind all these hundreds of granaries and fields and everything that indicated they used to be there, but no longer anybody can live there. So now, a massive post-flood catastrophe adequately explains many of these features. So let me show you something. Uh, I actually went on a trip maybe a little over 10 years ago with some friends from church on, on the river for 10 days. We rafted the river to kind of document it from below. You see it from above typically, we went, we went from below. We started right at the back of the funnel and then we went along the, the uh, Marble Canyon and the whole way down through. So let me show you what it's a little bit like. This, is, this will be a little kind of a fun trip down to the canyon. So you start off in these 40-foot rafts. They're as long as a bus. They, they pivot in two points. By the way, from there to this point on, for the next 10 days, there will be no bathrooms, there will be no cell service, and no Walmarts. Okay, so you get in, these, you get in this vehicle, in this, in this boat, that's all you have. All you, get, all you have is one little bag to keep your bedding and another little bag to take whatever clothes and towel, whatever you're going to take along. Nobody's trying to impress anybody else with how good you can look when you dress up. So, and we all look rather grungy. Okay, so the first, first, th first thing you see, and it's the last bridge you will see, it's the last sign of civilization you'll see for the next 10 days is Navajo Bridge right at the base of the funnel. And that's the one that I photographed this, this part of the, of the crack in. Notice how big the rafts are. As you go down through this whole area, you can imagine what John Wesley Powell must have felt as he went down through this area. He didn't have a motorboat, he just had a regular boat, but he never knew what was gonna be around any bend. He didn't know if death awaited him, big waterfall, he had no idea. He's the one who named this Marble Canyon because he thought the walls of the canyon looked like marble. Now notice, there's the other raft. It's a 40-foot raft. Notice that this is at the beginning of Marble Canyon. This is, there are, the walls are already high and they're about as low as they're going to be. And they're gonna keep getting higher and higher the further down you go. And I'm just gonna zip through some of these just for the sake of time. There are so many places you can stop and take hikes and walks all through the canyon. You'd never know looking at the top, or uh, when you look down to the canyon, it just looks like a giant mud hole. But when you're down there, there are amazing, there are trees, there's wildlife, there's all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't really imagine are at the bottom of the canyon. But the hikes you take, sometimes you start off in trails, but most of the time you wind up walking in little rivers because there is no trail. You're walking between cliffs. So you're constantly walking in the little rivers like this. Notice the ferns and everything. It's actually very, very beautiful. There's a lot more water at the base of this area than you might think. And lots of beautiful waterfalls. And that water is very cold. <laughs> so. Photography was best taken in the morning, oops, in the morning and at night because that's when the light is the best. That's when uh, the light comes out, you know, comes low and then everything glows much better. When the, when the sun is right above you, everything turns flat and, the, and everything's kind of colorless. So most of us took our pictures in the morning or in the evening and you can see how beautiful it gets all throughout the day, the evening and so forth. Well, as we came down to Nankoweep Canyon, we actually got out of the raft and hiked up the cliffs to the first granary, which is really just right overlooks the river. And you can actually see we're sitting right on the cliffs overlooking the river. And there are many, many granaries like this that you can, you can actually hike to all throughout Nankaweep Canyon. 
This is the opening or the mouth of the Little Colorado River. Notice it has a blue hue to it. This is because of chemicals washing out of the cliffs from above, and it gives kind of a blue hue. When you stand there at the confluence of both of them, you can actually see blue meeting very brown, and they kind of mix together, and, and then and it, it just uh, it all blends together. I was particularly impressed with all the reptiles. My wife would have loved the reptiles, and especially the snakes. No, I'm only kidding. She, she, would have, she would not have liked that. Anyway, I, I enjoyed that. But this fascinated me. How in the world does a deer get down there? I mean, places to the north and south are just nothing but sheer cliffs. How does a deer get here? It's astounding. And they're beautiful, beautiful grass for them to eat. Or on all the cliffs, we saw many, many, many of these guys. Bighorn sheep. They're, they were all over the place. We saw lots of those every day. Again, beautiful, beautiful reptiles. Well... It came down to the bend in the river, and here you can clearly see this uplifting sedimentary layers that I told you about. And you can see that the river looks like it's falling through, the, through these. It's not. It's going down at the, same, at the same speed, the same level, at the same elevation, but these are all pushed up, making it look like the river is falling down through. By the way, when you come through this area, they will always point out a very curious feature that the evolutionists are confused about. They call it the great unconformity. And they will stop the boat and show you the line. They'll say right here, this line right here is the great unconformity. And they will make it very clear why, what the problem is. The problem is this. Below that line, there are no fossils whatsoever of any kind. Immediately starting at that line and above it are many fossils of all kinds of creatures complex creatures. So to them, in their imagination, they're imagining Darwin's, you know, column of time, they're saying, well, there is a billion and a half years of missing geology here when life supposedly accidentally started, and there should be, that all should be caught in there through all these layers, showing slightly more complex little worm creatures and whatever, to the point where then we find the fossils that we do find. So, since we, since we have no fossils from this line down, and suddenly all the fossils from there up, yeah. it's called the great unconformity. Why? Because it doesn't conform to their theory. They say there's a missing billion and a half years. So I said, no, <laughs> so our boat, I said, no. No, there isn't a, anything missing here. This is pre-flood, this is post, this is flood-borne sediments, full of dead, animals. And liquefaction, which is the action of the moon and so forth coming around, pulling up the sedimentary layers and packing them down, pulling them up and packing them down for all the time that the flood was going on. That's lifting and sorting the fossils according to density and so forth. All of that's going on. Anyway, people all want to know, what do you do to go to the bathroom on a trip like this? Well, they tell you when you start, Men, whenever we stop for lunch or for a hike, if you've got to go to the bathroom, you go number one in the river. Men go upstream, women go downstream. So the very first time we stopped, man, everybody was hiking like 32 miles to find the most secluded spot and, you know, and nobody, you know, so nobody can see me. After three days, nobody cared anymore. It's just like you get out, you just go into the river and you pee and that's all. And, you know. But number two, the park, the national park requires you carry number two out. So they had these pots that were in the basement of the boats. One of the boats had all of the, had, a, had certain things in it. The other boat had food and ice, and that's where he carried all of our food. But this was, this is the, uh, this is the throne, okay? So this is what will happen is they'll take it to a secluded part away from where the camp is going to be. They take it to a secluded part, and they'll put that in the sand, unscrew the top, and then screw on like a toilet seat. So that becomes the bathroom. So the entrance to the bathroom was a shovel that they'd shove into the sand and they'd hang from the shovel one of the life rafts or one of the life, um, uh, not, not even a life raft, just a cushion from the boat, from one of the boats. They'll hang that on the shovel. And then there was a little thing of water there that you could operate with your foot to, you know, as a pump, you know, you could pump, you know, you wash your hands, okay? So the idea was if you had to go to the bathroom, you come to the shovel, you take the cushion with you, you walk down the path around the corner behind the trees and you use the bathroom. So if somebody else comes, they see the cushion's gone, that means the door's closed, somebody's in the bathroom and you wait there for them to bring the cushion back. The humorous part is so many people kept forgetting to take the cushion with them to the bathroom. 
So anyway, <laughs> so that was kind of a, that was always kind of an embarrassing thing. By the way, I, by the way, I got to tell you that there was a Brit, there was two British ladies there. One of them was just an absolute riot all the time. She had this dry British sense of humor. Well, every time you went into that thing and you looked in, obviously, before you sat down, you realize your system is not the only one that has completely shut down. <laughs> Everybody's system is shutting down. Nothing in that pot is normal at all. <laughs> so you sit down there. So this British girl comes back and she comes back and she goes, oh, I can't believe it. Even the flies are dying. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, there weren't any flies, because that's another thing we learned. If an insect dares to fly in Grand Canyon, it's dead real quickly, because the bats will find it immediately. So when you get up and go to the bathroom at night, you have to go maybe pee in the river, take your flashlight, whatever. as soon as you turn on that beam, immediately a little bat flying in the beam. Any mosquito dares to fly, any night creature dares to fly, it's dead. So you never had any bugs on you whatsoever. So that was very, very cool. That was, that was neat. So, and we kind of got to know each other on, this, on, the, on these trips. Well, how about looking at a camp? This was a typical camp by the river. Um, you can see that the blue tarp is sort of the basis for your bedding. You put your sleeping bag on top of that. There's another one. If you want to go to the bathroom, you go in the river. You want to go wash your hair, you go in the river. You want to go swimming, you go in the river. You want to get a, some water, you go in the river. <laughs> no, I don't think yeah, that you did. We did, but that, but that water was filtered. <laughs> okay. And then you can see all the rapids from, from, uh, from Lee's Point onward, just there's rapids. And all, the reason why there are rapids is because every time there's a big rain, stones and rocks get washed down through the many, many hundreds of side canyons into the river. And the river tumbles over those rocks, and that's why you have rapids. So, again, I had to catch the reptiles. I was just so fascinated with the reptiles. But they, they weren't the only creatures. There were ants that were all over the ground every place we went. And they told us, just be careful of these big red ants, because you, if you get bitten by it, you will know it. Now, none of us ever got bitten, but Carrie, my wife, did get bitten one year when we were on our Southwest Safari. She says, man, her whole leg went numb after a while, right? It bit you behind her knee, and, and that, it was really painful for a while. But at nighttime, different creatures come out. And if you shine a black light on a scorpion, it turns brilliant blue-green at night. And you can, as we were out shining this black light, there were people sleeping a couple feet away from us, you know, and. Now this one, I was, on my, I was on the ground, on my stomach, and it was running underneath me. My camera was tight against my chest. It was running right under my camera. I wanted to, and notice he's not trying to sting, but his, he's got his pinchers out. He's just not really happy with me, with me being that close to him. So anyway. I just thought you might want to see some of the creatures that go around the ground tonight. Okay, who wants to go on a rafting trip through the canyon? All right. <laughs> Most people say, no, well, that kind of bug and that kind of bathroom, that's not for me. All right. So by the time we get down kind of to the western end, you know, we've, we've been on, you know, everybody's gross and grungy and everything by that time. But still, you can actually still see features. Like here you can see that marbling again with that liquid rock as it went pouring up through this whole area is nothing but lava. All the hikes we took, all the walks, just nothing but lava everywhere. All the walls, everything. And so, but it's beautiful. Slot canyons and you know, all through this area too. And uh, if the canyon's about anything, obviously it's about geology. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so you can see lava through here as well, as, as it's all hardened now. Now, throughout the trip, we were going through rapids. And... Um, so as you're going through these rapids, there are many of them per day. If you're sitting at the front of the boat, you're going to get wet, or you're at least going to get, you know, sprayed on. I sat at the back because I had three cameras and I didn't want them ruined. By the end of the trip, my cameras were some of the only ones still working. So, but when we got to the big rapids, I, uh, I locked my camera in Ziploc bags and put them in my ammo can, locked them down, and I went to the front of the raft because I wanted to experience these things up close and personal. So this water is very cold and you're getting thoroughly soaked.
And then the largest one in Grand Canyon is Lava Falls. I had already been through it, so I was filming the other boat coming at us. They beach the boat, they tie everything down, they read you the riot act to hang on, and then you start down through the waterfall. This is not just a rapids, this is actually a waterfall. It doesn't look like it here, but you literally drop. <laughs> it's a, oh yeah, oh yeah, the boat the boats had power. Yes, the boats had power. So we could we could run at about ten miles an hour all the whole way through. Okay, here's the icing on the cake as we begin to kind of wrap it up. Here's the icing on the cake. What explains Grand Canyon also explains so much more. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the four states. Here you have Arizona, to the north is Utah, to its east is Colorado, and you have New Mexico. So what we've just been looking at the fe are the features Grand Canyon and Marble Canyon. So with those two things in mind, those are, the, those are the big features that you go to the area to see, Grand Canyon. But to the north is Zion Canyon. Zion Canyon is in existence because it was at the edge of the plateau, and as the plateau raised up, a lot of water leaked out the side. There were many leak points. Oak Creek Canyon is another one, and some of them are spectacular leak points. Zion Canyon is one. Other places like Bryce Canyon are some of the highest points that it went to. And then water leached out of those interesting mudstone layers and forming those weird features called hoodoos. Or you go in kind of the central area here, you'll see an amazing feature that you stand, you go up onto a, a, what's called the island in the sky. This is, uh, this is not Monument Valley, this is Canyonlands National Park. And as you stand at the various viewpoints on this plateau, and look off in the distance as far as you can see in every direction, what does that look like? Take off any evolutionary glasses, what does it look like? If you've ever watched anybody drain a lake, this is exactly what a drained lake looks like. Because always in a drained lake, where the main river flows through, it always has inner collapses like this as well. This is very obviously the basin of a drained lake. And in, in Dead Horse Point State Park, on the same, along that same ridge, this, this is Dead Horse Point. And uh, this is also, um, this would have been an island in the lake. Now it's called Island in the Sky. To the north of that is a very famous park, Arches National Park, at least 2,000 documented arches in this park. And they, when sandstone erodes, it always erodes in this curious arch formation. And the only thing that would have eroded this area so much is, is moving water through that whole area. Off to the east into Colorado is the Colorado National Monument. Then you move off to the south to, Ca to Mo Monument Valley. This is very famous because you can see where John, a lot of John Wayne movies were filmed here. And this just looks like it. Now notice something else that's interesting. This is the floor, part of the floor of Grand Lake. All of these would have been islands in the lake and they would have been much bigger. As the lake left, a lot of them just collapsed in the river. Uh, the moving water just carried a lot of it away. If these things had been standing here for millions of years, these would just be big humps of material. You're not going to have these cliffs standing here for millions of years. There wouldn't be anything left. This is just sandstone. It's constantly falling down. So to the south of that, you have Canyon de Chez. And even further south, you have a very interesting uh, set of scenes right out in the desert. You have this painted desert, and it's painted because of silica in the region. Silica can be dissolved, but then when it hardens again, it gets very hard like concrete. So in this region, there are tens of thousands of fossilized trees. That's why this is called the petrified forest. Tens of thousands of petrified trees through this area. What in the world happened? Why are there so many petrified trees right in this area, in the middle of the eastern desert of Arizona? Well, notice, these are just the parts we highlighted, and there's at least twice that number that are national parks and state parks, I should say. State and local parks all through this area. But notice where they are. They are all on the Colorado Plateau. But notice what's missing, the two lakes. And when we superimpose them on there, something suddenly becomes obvious. These two parks were in existence, Zion and Bryce, because of the formation of the plateau as it lifted up. But all of these were formed or revealed when the lakes left the area. In the case of the petrified forest, 
all those trees were floating, just like up at Spirit Lake at Mount St. Helens. The prevailing winds are from the west, so all those logs would have floated to the east since this was a very, uh, an area full of, uh, of, of dissolved um, silica and so forth. All of that soaked into the rock, into the trees, petrified them, and as the lake cooled, all those petrified logs sank right at the bottom of the lake, right where they appear today. And when the lake left the area, when it breached at this side, all the water goes rushing to the west, leaving those, all those piles of trees right where they sit today, right where you would expect it, in the middle of the eastern Arizona desert. Now, when did all of this happen? It all likely, it all, uh, it likely happened perhaps several hundred years after the flood ended. Why would we say that? Here are just several reasons why. We cover more of that. Uh, of this idea in the, in the actual video. Here are several reasons why it would have maybe taken that long. The Rocky Mountains had to sink into the mantle enough to lift the Colorado Plateau 62 feet in elevation. That might have taken a couple hundred years. There's no way to really know, for, but it might have taken a while to do that. Enough time had to pass for that 350 foot thick layer of Kaibab limestone to harden and especially become brittle enough up in Marble Canyon to crack. Now remember, the, the Kaibab limestone is the part that you stand on when you're standing at both sides of the canyon. That is the layer you stand on. But further up that whole feature, that same layer becomes the floor of the funnel. That same layer is the floor. Enough time had to pass for that 350 foot thick layer to harden and become brittle enough to crack when the breach happened and the land pushed down, literally bulging up the center and cracking it, so the Colorado River flows down through that region today. Another reason is this, enough time had to pass for Hopi Lake to cool and its silica-rich waters to soak into and petrify all those floating logs, and so they sank right where they are today. Here's an interesting idea. Indian legends, and our video starts with one of them. A Navajo told me that he went up to his up to the, the tribal leaders and said, asked them, how did the canyon form? The leaders told them long ago, there was a, it was, a, it was a violent earthquake and a long roaring sound that scared everybody. And when it all ended, they sent scouts in every direction to see what happened. One group of scouts came back and reported the existence of a very large hole. So the video begins with that legend. That perfectly squares with what would have happened. If those lakes breached like that, can you imagine the rush of water? Can you imagine the, 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 how the earth would have shaken as land would have lifted and so forth? That, that legend is probably very, very accurate. What kind of footprints do you think these are? These are dinosaur footprints right in the silica that is now as hard as rock, but notice where they are. They are in the western end of Hopi Lake as that lake breached the area and just left all this mud there before it had a chance to harden, animals were walking through that area. And here are some dinosaurs that left their footprints as they walked from one side to the other in the western end of Hopi Lake. So now, just to quick recap. Number one, there was a global flood that literally bulged up the mountains. The mountains pushed up and then toward the end of the flood and afterwards they sank, pushing up a plateau. As the plateau lifted up, it lifted up these lakes, which continued to grow for perhaps a couple hundred years. Eventually, the northern lake breached in the southwest corner, starting a huge rush of water all across the southern part of the plateau, literally denuding the area. It wore away the western wall of Hopi Lake and the waters of both lakes rushed westward, gouging out the remainder of the canyon and leaving a track of material even as far west as into California and all along the track of the current Colorado River the whole way down to and including the smaller bits and pieces that would have wound up in the northern part of the Gulf of California, right where you would expect it. Now, to wrap up, to conclude, when you look at the beauty of the canyon, think about what formed it. A catastrophe, a horrific event that literally ripped, well, ripped this part of the world apart. None of us knows what the earth looked like to begin with when God first created it. It would have been a beautiful place. And God himself said, it is good. It would have been phenomenal. That world, according to 2 Peter, is gone. It is gone. 
A lot of it got buried in the sediments. But isn't it amazing that God, even in destruction, leaves behind such beauty that we wound up calling them all national parks? So doesn't He still show His incredible creative capability even in, even in destruction? To me, that says, the, or it, it parallels what Jesus Christ does for a human being. Our lives are totally ruined and wrecked by sin. And we are headed for a Christless eternity, damaged forever. But through Jesus Christ, with His redemptive creative ability, comes along and redeems us and makes us beautiful and new again. Isn't that, that to me, isn't that the lesson that we can take away from the canyon? Beauty from chaos. That's exactly what Jesus Christ does for us. Folks, I hope this has been simple enough to grasp, interesting enough to, that you might know at least to be able to understand this theory. And I suppose we are at a Q&A time, I suppose, if you want to do that. And my wife will be happy to come up and answer any questions that any of you have. Okay. Thank you.